Welcome everyone. Morning. Good. Uh, today we have the pleasure to have with our speaker, Elena Maldenstam from uh, Berkeley. And she will tell us about the journey from algebraic geometry and combinatorial physics. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's very nice to be here. Um, so this is actually my first colloquium talk. I'm used to, I'm more used to talking to algebraic geometry or combinatorics audiences at seminars or conferences. So I'll do my best, but please interrupt me if you have any, if anything's unclear, if I'm assuming too much. Um, yeah, I'd really like it to be as understandable as possible. And I was possibly too, a little too ambitious with the amount of material on my slides. So it's okay if we don't get to everything. Um, yeah, I'll just speed through the end. But all right, so I'll start. Uh -oh. So no. Oh, no, it works. Okay. It's convincing. Great. So now I will tell you about the main protagonist of the talk today. So this was the Grismanian, denoted GRKN. I'll be talking about the real Grismanian. And so this is um, a mathematical object important to many fields of math. And it is a space that parameterizes k-dimensional subspaces of R to the N. So one way you can think about this, the way that I like to think about it, so any vector space that I've ever met comes with a basis. So I can, okay, I guess I forgot to say, these are also k-dimensional planes in projective space if you, k-minus one-dimensional planes in n-minus one-dimensional projective space if you prefer to think of it that way. Anyway, so if I put the basis of my vector space into a matrix, it makes a k by n matrix, and that can represent, that's a representative for my subspace, but of course, this isn't unique because we can change our basis. So we need to quotient out by left multiplication. Um, and just for example here, if we have a two-dimensional subspace spanned by V1 and V2, that's also spanned by V1 plus V2 and V2. And this change of basis is represented by multiplication by this invertible matrix here. And so this space, we can think of it as matrices modular left multiplication. We can also think about it as a projective variety by embedding it into n choose k minus one dimensional projective space through its k by k minors, which are called the Plucker coordinates. So for example, if we have this two dimensional subspace of R4, that's a two by four matrix, most of the time we can express it, we can row reduce it and express it in such a way. And we write down its two by two minors, so the first one is one, that's the determinant of this two by two submatrix. The next one is C, it's the determinant of the submatrix given by the columns one and three. Then minus A is given by two and three. D is given by one and four. Minus B is two and four. And then finally we have AD minus BC, that's three and four. And this is a point in five dimensional projective space. We have six coordinates, which is four choose two, and then that's four choose two minus one dimensional projective space. But as you might be able to tell, not every point in this five dimensional projective space represents a subspace because once we fix A, B, C, and D, this last minor is set. So we actually have a relation called a Plinker relation in the Grissomanian 2, 4, this is the only one, and it tells us that the 1, 2 minor, which is in this case 1, times the 3, 4 minor is equal to the, um, a, a, well, this, this sum or this difference. So in this case, this is the only relation as long as this is satisfied by our coordinates in P5, we represent a subspace. In general, as n and k get larger, we have more of these Plucker relations, but they all look something like this. And this is how we can view the Grossmannian as an algebraic variety or zero set of these polynomials. 
any questions so far? So both the columns there are no relations. Yeah. Yeah, this is the two four is the smallest corresponding with the poker relation. All right. And so this is uh, an object important in algebraic geometry and other fields as well. In algebraic common Turks, it uh, became of massive interest when Posnikov introduced the positive Grismanian in 2006. So this is the subset of the Grismanian where we restrict that all of the coordinates, so all of these coordinates have to be non-negative. So actually it's called the totally non-negative Grismanian, but that's a lot of words. So I, I and some other people say positive. Um, and this is allowed so far. Um, okay, so uh, they're all non-negative coordinates. So here that would amount to say C and D are positive and B are negative, and then this uh, difference also needs to be positive. So these are some restrictions. This is no longer a variety. We can't just express it as a zero set of polynomials. It's what's called a semi-algebraic set, which is a combination of zero set of polynomials plus inequalities. Um, all right, and so this uh, object has a very rich combinatorial structure. Um, there are many uh, objects uh, in, in this first paper by Posnikov, he uh, introduced several new combinatorial objects, Grassmann necklaces, um, lead diagrams, playbook graphs that uh, are all kind of related to the structure of the positive Grismark. So somehow introducing this positivity condition gives us very interesting things mathematically. Turns out it also gives us interesting things in physics. So now I'll talk about the two kind of physics directions that I'll talk about today. So the first one is about water waves. So there is a partial differential equation that describes the motion of water waves called the KP equation named after these two people. And it describes the behavior of water waves like the ones in these pictures. Here we're solving for a function P. P is a function of two variables, X and Y, which are space variables. They tell us where we're located. And T is the time variable. So at time T and at space coordinates X and Y, this records the height of the wave. Um, and so this was, this is an equation that's of interest to physicists um, and I guess people who work in integrable systems. And so I'll talk about that in the second part of the talk. In the first part of the talk, I will talk about the connection to scattering amplitudes. This is in particle physics. So in CERN, they run experiments where they shoot a bunch of particles at each other and then they interact somehow right. and then you get particles back. And we'd like to describe these processes. This is a somewhat random process. We would like to give the probabilities that if we input some particles with certain data, we get um, some specific data back. So to formalize this, we find a scattering amplitude. It's a function. Um, it comes from the data that describes the particles that you are shooting in. Uh, in, in and then uh, the scattering process happens. And then we uh, get out the joint probability. So that's the, it's norm squared is the joint probability density function for the outcome of the experiment. So this is, of course, interesting to particle physicists. And these scattering amplitudes had, uh, for a long time, they've had a very clear mathematical way, I mean, in the simplified, simplified uh, version of it. Um, they have a, I guess you can draw it like this. So you have some, some particles and then you can put variables on these and give them inputs talking about um, their speeds and masses and all of these, all of these things we can, we can assign to them. And then there's a mystery that happens in here. And so to compute the scattering amplitudes, there was a way of, of doing this. Um, they were computed by a perturbative process where you have to sum over hundreds of what are called Feynman diagrams, which looks something like assigning, you're assigning something that happens in, in this graph. It, it's basically just a bunch of graphs that we 
put into here. And if we sum over all possibilities and do these computations, uh, we get things called Feynman integrals, and then we can compute the scattering amplitude. But this um, takes hundreds of pages of computations. But this was the, the best that we could do until 2013, when two physicists, or Nimar Hani Hamed and Yaroslav Trinka, introduced the amplitohedron, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And this uh, expressed um, the scattering amplitudes as volumes of the amplitohedra, which are geometric spaces. So if we're able to describe the amplitohedron, then um, this reduces the, these 100 page computations to something much simpler. Is the relation between Feynman diagrams and flabby graphs? Yes, they're it's they similar. Are the same. In, yes. In yeah, Feynman, Feynman diagrams are flabby graphs. Okay. So this is really, this is, gives some association between how gas may are entering. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. Well, and you'll see, it. so the amplitohedron is defined from the gas may. So. So the Arkani, these are physicists. These, these are physicists. And yes. they use the, the block, block, block of diagrams to the gas in their paper. Um, Explicitly, or I actually have not read their paper. Okay, the physics. Yes, this is translation. Yes, yeah, so physicists, as we know, don't need to prove anything. Um, okay, so okay. They, they they introduced this object and they showed that um, you can use it. Of but I did not read it in detail. Good. Read the math papers that followed. All right, so. Now on the next slide, I'll define the amplitohedron. So the amplitohedron is the image of a map called the amplitohedron map. So it has parameters N, K, M, and Z, a matrix. Wow. So the map goes from the positive Grismanian KN to a smaller Grismanian, not positive, just regular Grismanian. So smaller I say because we have a restriction that K plus M is not greater than N or the map works by taking a subspace. So here we have k-dimensional subspaces with a positivity restriction. So we take a k-dimensional subspace and we map it to z times that. Um, we get a new k-dimensional subspace in our smaller space in R to the k plus m. And our restriction here is that z is also a totally positive matrix, which means that all of its minors, all of its k plus m by k plus m minors have to be positive. There's a, a Z and a Z tilde? Yes, Z it's... tilde is the induced map. Yeah, Z is a linear map. Z tilde is the induced induced map on the Grassmannians. You multiply by Z on the right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess it depends how you, how you write it. All right, so for a small example, k equals one. Um, so here uh, we have um, a map from the Grassmannian one comma n, which is one dimensional subspaces of R to the n. These are lines in R to the n. So this is actually just n minus one dimensional projective space. So we're mapping from points which are positive in n minus one dimensional projective space. So we can just write down, write it down in coordinates, a1 to a n, where we just remember that all of them have to be non-negative. And we're mapping that into the Grassmannian one, m plus one, which again are lines in R to the m plus one for m dimensional projective space. And we're mapping it with the map z, which is a totally positive matrix that size n by m plus one. So if we write this out, we get the sum of AI, ZI, where the AIs are all non-negative. And then also remember, we started off in projective space and we're going into projective space. If we want to draw a picture of this and dehomogenize, then we can dehomogenize by taking all, taking the sum of A1 to AN equal to one, choose that dehomogenization, 
then what we get right here is the sum of AI, ZI, where AI are all non-negative and all of the AI sum to one. So these are exactly the convex combinations of the Zs. So if we take our, our rows, Z1 to Zn, draw, draw the points, then what we get are all of the convex combinations of those points, which is the polytope that's the convex hull of those points. Moreover, since we started with a special matrix Z, it had to be totally positive. What we get is actually a special polytope called the cyclic polytope. So if you know what this means, that's great. If not, just know it's a very special kind of polytope. <clears throat> and so just as these are very special linear maps, so in general, if we didn't take a positive matrix, we would just get a polytope, convex combination of a bunch of points. So um, that's to, to highlight that these are very special linear maps. So in your example, M is one. K is one. And what is M? M is a two, uh, two, I guess, because I'm drawing a two-dimensional picture. And N is a uh, five. So how do you interpret the thing on the right? Is yeah. something in the... So this is, a, yeah, because it's actually in projective space. If I have my zero somewhere over here, then I actually have kind of the cone over it. So if I draw the line, lines from zero, uh, I guess a point here is a line through the origin. It's like a section. Yeah. So maybe I'll draw it as a triangle. If I had a triangle instead, it would look like this. Imagine there's no pentagon here instead. All right, so this is actually a, what we get in general, are projective polytopes, which are uh, defined exactly in this way. It's a map from the simplex, which is what we get when they all add up to one, um, a linear map from the simplex. All right, so that's k equals one. With larger parameters, it gets substantially more complicated. Um, but uh, larger parameters are what's, what's of physical interest. Um, still, uh, so this gives, um, I guess, some intuition for how it works with, with small parameters. And so in general, it's, it, it's called an amplitohedron, which suggests that it's a polytope, usually things ending with hedron are polytopes. It's in fact not. Um, it's, it becomes very non-polytopal in, in general with higher parameters. Um, but it's, it's called this because it's something that helps you compute amplitudes. And then when k equals 1, it is a polytope. So only for k equals 1, it's a polytope. Yes. For k equals 2, it's some another structure. Mm -hmm. Well, it also, I guess, depends on K and M, but yeah, in general, others. And so actually, uh, M is in general the parameter. So when M equals four, this is um, for now of the most interest to physicists because it uh, corresponds to what's called N equals four symmetric angles theory. So I was told that the four and N equals four and the four from this M are not the same four. Um, but the uh, corresponds to this. And then when M equals two, this is also of interest to physicists. Um, I will be talking about M equals one, which is of interest to mathematicians. Um, all right. And so, as I said, these maps, uh, when we have a totally positive matrix, these are very special linear maps. And actually, um, well, just because the physicist said that this is what they care about, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to restrict ourselves to this. So we might also be interested in what's called, what we call grass topes. So this is the same definition, which is now the G and KM. It's the image of the same map, induced map from a matrix, except now we drop the requirement that the matrix is totally positive. We're still mapping from the total, from the positive Brismanian, but now, you might see I drew a dashed line. This is because now what we have is a rational map because we're starting with a subspace of dimension K 
if we happen to map any of these to zero when we map through Z, then what we get is not a k-dimensional subspace anymore, which is bad. It's not, it's not well defined on such points. <laughs> so uh, since it's not well defined everywhere, it's a rational map. Um, we don't want it to drop in dimension. So an observation is that this map is not well defined exactly when uh, our vector space that we're starting with intersects the kernel of our matrix non-trivially. If this happens, then on that point, the map is not well defined. This set is called the base locus of our map. And a natural question is, when are these maps well-defined on the entire um, non-negative Grossmannian? So I kind of hid this from you on this slide. Here, actually, the positivity of Z guarantees that the map is well-defined. But once we remove that condition, we don't have this guarantee anymore. So a natural question is to ask, what is necessary for us to know that the map is well-defined on the entire positive Grossmannian? So Thomas Lamb investigated this in 2016. He considered this condition. There exists a K plus M by K matrix M, such that the K by K minors of Z times M are positive. And he showed that this was a sufficient condition for the map induced from Z to be well-defined. Um, but he asked whether it was necessary as a conjecture. Then uh, the next year, Stephen Karp provided a combinatorial description of well-defined maps, but it still wasn't clear from his combinatorial characterization whether it was the same as this condition of Thomas Lem. But then the same year, a little bit later, public Olashen showed that condition one was not necessary. He provided a counterexample that satisfied Karp's condition, but um, did not satisfy Lamb's condition. However, this condition, it came out of some geometric intuition. So it's still a valuable, a valuable thing to consider whether our matrix satisfies it. So this um, prompted Thomas Lamb to come up with this terminology. So if a matrix satisfies this condition one, we know it's well-defined and it's extra well-behaved because it satisfies this condition. So it's called tame. And if the matrix is well-defined but does not satisfy this condition, then it's called wild. And so the idea is that they're somehow less well-behaved than tame ones. And um, in, in our work, so we studied grass topes um, in this paper that I'll tell you about. Uh, and our goal was to study these wild grass topes because they really were just, after this definition, they really were just ignored. Um, but also we thought, well, even though this map is not necessarily well-defined, that doesn't mean we still can't consider the image even when it's not well-defined. We can just take the base locus, the points where it's not well-defined, we can throw it away and then look at the image of everything that's left. And so we called this, oops, we called this a rational grass toe. It's the image of a rational map. Uh, so our goal was to study both of these, but I, I want to tell you about the rational ones because uh, I'll be moving on to the water waves. All right, so this first proposition, so this is something that we believe was known to Lamb, just never, it's one of those things that is known to the experts but never written down. So we wrote it down um, and it's, uh, I guess, a formalization of why this condition is meaningful. So we showed that a matrix, so here we fixed Again, our paper, we didn't fix m equal to one, but it makes the statement a little more complicated. So here I'll fix m equals one. And from now on, we're gonna consider only m equals one. So we fix m equals one. And then an n by k plus one matrix C satisfies this condition. So it's grass to is tame. If and only if there exists a hyperplane in the ambient space of the grass tope, which does not intersect the grass tope. So what this means, is if our matrix satisfies this condition, the grass tope is tame, and we wanted to draw an affine picture, we're in a projective space, but we want to draw an affine picture, then we can dehomogenize with respect to the hyperplane that does not intersect it. This is the hyperplane at infinity. If we dehomogenize with respect to it, since it does not intersect our grass tope, we will get a bounded picture. 
However, if the matrix is not tame, then every hyperplane intersects our gas tope. So no matter how we dehomogenize, we will always have points at infinity. Our picture will always be unbounded. So what this means is that our gas tope for m equals one, it's tame if and only if we can draw its image in some outline chart and it'll be bounded. What is chart? Um, I guess a representation of our projective space, but drawn um, F, F, in an affine way. So like here, if this is the projective space where our points in our projective space are represented by lines, yeah. um, then the affine picture would be this triangle. Yeah, the right local points. So just something that's um, a section. A section. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And we can we can do this in different ways if we do much as with respect to different things. So I could take this section, but I could also take a more diagonal section, then I'll get an elongated triangle. Or I could do some some weird things and then I'll get points at infinity. All right. Okay, now I'll quickly give an, another. So this is for the thing, please. Sorry? This is for the thing, please. Yeah, in the tame case, it can be drawn in an outline chart. In the wild case, it cannot. It will always be unbounded. So there's at least uh, some meaningful difference between tame and wild rest hopes. Um, all right, and I guess one thing I should say is the amplitohedron is tame. It's uh, relatively easy to check uh, this, that this condition is satisfied. All right, so now another definition is the sign variation. So uh, sign variation of a vector is the number of sign changes in it when we ignore zeros. So if we look at one minus one, one, two, we change from plus to minus, minus to plus, that's two sign changes. Var bar is the maximum number of sign changes when we can, we're free to change the zeros however we want. So if we look at this one, zero, one, one, zero, the variation is zero because we ignore zeros and we're always positive. But if we change the bar bar, then we could make the zeros negative, and then we go from plus to minus, minus to plus, plus to minus again, that's three sign changes. So sometimes it can really increase if we move to bar bar. Sometimes it doesn't change. If we take bar bar of minus one, zero, one, that's the same as bar of minus one, zero, one, which is just one. So I need this definition to tell us about um, so first, the amplitohedron. So Harp and Williams studied the M equals one amplitohedron in 2019. And they gave a complete description of what it looks like. So this is, again, we're mapping from positive Grismanian Kn to a k-dimensional projective space. And this is a restatement of their theorem, stated in slightly more complicated terms. Um, but one part of their main theorem is that the m equals one amplitohedron consists of the closure of bounded regions of hyperplanes corresponding to rows of z. So I haven't explained how we get hyperplanes that come from rows of z. I will in a couple of slides, but if you believe that each row of z defines a hyperplane, in this case, uh, we're in P2, our hyperplanes are lines. So each one gives us a line, then we take the bounded regions defined by these lines, take their union, that'll be the, I mean, this, the amphitheater. Now, part two of the theorem is that the bounded regions are exactly the ones whose sign vectors have at least K sign changes with respect to the orientation of the hyperplane. So not only do we get hyperplanes from each row, we get oriented hyperplanes from each row. So we put an arrow, each one, the, uh, from coming from a totally positive matrix, it'll always look something like this. We'll have a cyclic hyperplane arrangement. And um, yeah, the arrows are all pointing in the same direction. And then we can write down the sign vector. So red is one, orange is two, yellow is three, green is four. You can write down the sign changes. So this one's on the plus side of all of them. This one's on the plus side of red and green and on the minus side of the other two. And here we have two sign changes, from plus to minus, minus to plus. So this is in our amplitudehedron. This was their theorem statement. And actually in the same paper, they noted that uh, 
Their proofs also work for the more general case of tame uh, grass toques, but they have no idea what goes on with wild ones. Um, I guess the name makes it sound a little bit scary because they might be badly behaved. So now I'll explain this, this part, uh, hyperplanes corresponding to rows of Z. So the hyperplanes are oriented hyperplanes. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so first, uh, this is kind of a nice linear algebra or projective geometry question. So if we have a hyperplane in the Grissonian K, K plus one in Plucker coordinates, that means we have K plus one coordinates that represent the minors of our matrix that represents our hyperplane. K by K plus one matrix, and it has K plus one minors. And we're given it in Plucker coordinates. How can we actually write down the equation of the hyperplane? So for example, when K equals two, when I say that a point lies in our hyperplane, so this will be the span of two vectors, V and W, we can give them coordinates. They're just we're in a two by three matrix. So if I say that X is in our hyperplane, that means that X and the point V and W are linearly dependent. Them being linearly dependent means that if we put them on a matrix, the determinant vanishes. And I can then compute. So I don't know, some people, for some people it's maybe been a long time since you've computed a determinant. I'll remind you, we can expand by the first, the first row, and we get x1 times this 2, 3 minor minus x2 times the 1, 3 minor, so that's what I mean by p2, 3, and p1, 3, plus x3 by the 1, 2 minor. So if I write this down, this gives me the equation of the hyperplane, and this is exactly actually in terms of the Plucker coordinates. The only thing is normally if I'm given Plucker coordinates, then the order I get them in would be P12, P13, P23. So what I want to do then to get the equation is I want to reverse the order and then put alternating signs on them. And that's the same thing that happens in general. So in general, it's exactly the same situation. You put them all in a matrix and do a Laplace expansion of the determinant with the, the X row. You get this, um, this equation and it's reversing the order of the minors and putting alternating signs on them. And so then if I get a row of my matrix, I can take the row as the projective coordinates, and then I can write down the line that I get. So here I have Z plus Y plus two X. This is in my P2. And How do you know what is the orientation? Yes, so this gives me a linear form. So maybe if I, instead of putting equal zero, I just left it as z plus y plus two x. So then the positive orientation is where it's greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Um, and this, yeah, so, okay. So then I can choose my dehomogenization eventually and I get, um, if I just dehomogenize with respect to the x coordinate, and I relabel, I get y plus x plus two equals zero. So now I'm, uh, so that's how we get um, these hyperplanes from the rows. So now I'm ready to state our, our main result of our paper. So we also, as I said, we studied rational grass topes and others, but I will need to move on. Um, so, we actually showed an analogous result to the amplitudehedron um, and to the tame case, uh, just minus the boundedness part. So it's the same kind of sine vector characterization. So it consists of all regions with var bar, at least k, with respect to the hyperplanes defined by the rows of z. Um, so this is actually the first known wild matrix, the one that Pablo Galushin gave as a counterexample. We can write down the six lines that come from it. And we can, so this is kind of a 
non-standard dehomogenization because I actually am not allowed to dehomogenize with respect to any one of the variables. So I have to dehomogenize by x plus y. So if I do that, um, I get my new lines that I can draw in P2 in, in affine, two-dimensional affine space. So I draw them. Again, they have orientation. So where wherever this is greater than or equal to zero is the positive direction. So line four, the positive direction will be where y goes negative. So indeed, where y is negative, that's the uh, I need something. What is the can you point on focus? What is the difference between the time and the non tame and the y? Because it's it's only the same condition. You have seen yes. Um so in the tame case, there's also the it's the union of the bounded regions. And here? Here it will necessarily not be that way because uh, wild grass topes are always unbounded, no matter how you draw them. So the bar is the, the statistic is different. You either use the bar, bar bar. Yeah. So here the bar bar is more necessary than in the in the. Um, and they use the bar, not the bar. No, they the bar. so the bar bar is actually needed to get the closure to get the lines because the lines are uh, are zeros instead of a plus or a minus. So then you want you want the boundaries included because it's a closed object. So you do want the bar bar. Um, so bar bar is your contribution. No. Bar bar it also okay. existed there. Um, it's just there you could state that it's the closure of these regions. Um, here we need bar bar. It's more important for the rational grass tope case, which I'm not talking about. But so here you also have a, a region with a, all positive signs. Right? Is this of um, any importance? Yes, we do have a region with all positive signs. Is this of any importance? Is this such a good one? No, or at least I'm not. I don't think so. All right, so uh, once we get our lines, we can write out all the sign vectors. And then again, we can take all the regions that have at least two sign changes and they are included in our grass tope. And here we get a picture and you can actually see that no matter what line we draw, it will intersect our grass tope. So I guess a, a, a verification that this is actually wild. There's no line we can choose. So here actually, it looks like these three lines intersect. They actually do not, there's a little triangle there but it's too too small. All right, so for the rational case, um, we were able to get a similar result, except that the rational grass tope is not necessarily closed. So there, are, there may be issues on the boundary. I say maybe because we don't actually, we don't actually have an example where the boundary is not fully included. So the, the rational grass tope, uh, saying it out loud, we have a, a, the same theorem that it's, so the statement is that it is included in the space where var is at least k, sorry, it includes all of the points where var is at least k, and it is included in the space where var bar is at least k, but we don't know um, what actually goes on on the bound, or we're not sure what actually goes on on the boundaries. Um, and we have like many interesting topology questions that arise, plus combinatorial questions related to, so in the amplitudehedron, we always have the same number of regions in the grass tope. In the general grass tope case, we can have different numbers of regions. So uh, there are some interesting combinatorial questions that arise. Um, in this regard, we have some, some tables in our paper, uh, that, but, um, Still lots, lots to do in that direction. Um, and grass topes really ignored. People have really only studied the amplitudehedron. Um, so there's there's a lot, a lot still here. And I was just recently at a conference that was half physicists, half mathematicians. Um, we were talking about this, and when I talked about grass topes, some some physicists told me later that this is actually good and they think that they might be useful, that grass topes are also worth considering because um, they get in, in a certain, in certain models, they actually don't have the Z total positivity condition. What do you know about the number of regions? Yeah, so the amplitude hedron minimizes the number of regions always. And in general, 
um, for maximizing the number of regions we have a conjecture uh, that's in our paper. Um, but uh, so there's some easy kind of set theoretic bounds you can place on the number of regions in the grass tilt if you look at the total number of regions in a generic hyperplane arrangement and then subtract all of the sign the possible sign vectors that aren't included. Um, that's a lower bound for uh, sorry, that's an Okay, you can get some easy set theoretic bounds just by considering how many regions are in a hyperplane arrangement and how many sign vectors do we have with the correct number of sign changes. And then these bounds appear to be attained always, uh, both the minimum and the maximum, um, at least in our exp experiments. And moreover, there's some interesting things going on with uh, the common torques of oriented matroids. So uh, hyperplane arrangements connect to oriented matroids and you can um, look at just the oriented matroid and then you get some, some interesting things, but this is all in the paper, if you're curious. We also define a grass tope of an oriented matroid. Um, and you don't really do much with it, but the definitions in there and ready to be studied. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's, uh, oh, okay, I don't have time for the proof idea, I think. I really need it. Yeah, I need to move on to water waves. So um, this I will probably go through a little bit more quickly, um, just to give you a general, a general sense of what's going on here. So again, back to the KP equation. So another completely different direction in physics, partial differential equation in three variables. And this might not look like a simpler version of the equation, but it's a bilinearization. And um, it's actually uh, nicer, apparently. Um, and so, and if a uh, function tau of x, y, and t satisfies this differential equation, he wrote this differential equation, then the second derivative of the log with respect to x satisfies the KP equation. So we can look for these solutions called tau functions. And there um, are two very interesting approaches to constructing tau functions. One is from algebraic curves. Uh, Kritschevar studied this and others. And also we can uh, construct them from points in the Grismanian, and this is uh, from Sato. And um, I guess a long-term goal is to bring these, so so I, I guess in this talk, I will bring them a little bit closer together, but this, um, a long-term goal is to really explore the connection between these two ways. So we have kind of an algebraic geometry and a combinatorics direction. So um, here you really don't need to look too much at this expression, um, other than I guess here we have a sum that ranges over all k element subsets of one through n of pi times something. And so if we have something of this form, it's a solution to Hirota's differential equation if and only if these pi's are actually Ploeger coordinates. So if and only if this is a point in the Grossmannian. And this was uh, from Slato. And these kinds of solutions are called kn solitons. And solitons are uh, nice kind of solution with these solitary water waves like the pictures that I showed um, when I showed the KP equation slide. All right. And so actually, regular line solitons correspond to points in the positive Grossmannian. So if all these are positive, then we get nicer solutions, regular solutions. And Kodama and Williams studied the combinatorial structure of such solutions. So in particular, the Positive Grossmannian can be subdivided into positroid cells. This is due to Posnikov. And then from these positroid cells, we can get families of solutions. And um, they explored the combinatorial structures of these things. All right. And now I'll talk about the algebraic curves a bit. So um, if we have, so we fix a matrix B. Um, 
Did I not put? Okay, I'm, I didn't put a very important slide, so I will write it on the board. Okay, so when we have a curve of some sort, this is also um, a Riemann surface, so I think about, I like to think about it this way. The Riemann surface is a manifold complex dimension one. So a curve, you can you can think about it like this. So I think it's easier to explain the Riemann matrix this way. Then this has um, a homology basis. We have our alphas and betas. And then we also have a basis of differentials of size three. So they're all related to the genus, um, which in this case is three. So we have a basis of holomorphic functions. So now if I, I can put all of this in a matrix where I integrate mega one over alpha one, and over alpha two, alpha three, and then over the betas, where over here I'm integrating omega three over beta three. This is called, so these integrals are called periods, and this is the period matrix. And if I do a row reduction where I normalize one part of it to be the identity, what I get is a G by G matrix <laughs> called the Riemann matrix. And the Riemann matrix, from it, we can define a theta function, which is right here. So the Riemann matrix is B. And the theta function is an infinite sum of exponentials um, <clears throat> where we're summing over the entire integer lattice. And um, it's a function of Z. And maybe B. And then it's a sum of exponentials in terms of z, b, and c. I won't write exactly what it is, but so these are theta functions and these are associated to curves. Okay. And so Pritchard and Shiota, they showed different directions of this theorem that we can use, we can use these theta functions to get tau functions. So if we put instead of tau, we put a theta function. And the theta function is a function of just one variable z. To make it a function of x, y, and t, we can um, introduce these parameters u, v, and w, so that ux plus vy plus wt is z. So now we have a theta function of z and a Riemann matrix b. And this is a solution to the kp equation if and only if or there exist u, v, and w such that this is a solution if and only if b comes from a Jacobian or in other words, is a Riemann matrix for a curve. Um, so for a specific curve, genus g with Riemann matrix b, we can look for tau that are these theta functions. And then the question is, we know that they exist, but what actually are the u, v, and w that satisfy this? So this, um, inspired the definition of the Dubrovin Griefold, because Dubrovin was also a mathematician who studied this in 2020. And it's uh, given a curve C. It's a set of all points U, V, and W in a weighted projective spaces. We need a, a weighting. Um, it doesn't really matter for this talk. But think of it as in being in projective space, such that uh, the theta function satisfies Hirota's differential equation. So. And they actually showed that this is an algebraic variety. They gave equations for it. The curve is embedded in it. It's all very interesting. Um, but it's a variety that each point in this variety gives us a solution to the KP equation that is coming from this specific curve, C. And this was done for smooth curves. Um, in a follow-up work, we decided to do it for uh, non-smooth curves, having at most nodal singularities. To do this, we did it with a tropical limit. The way we did it was defining a curve over a non-Archimedean field, which you can think of as a family of curves that depend on a parameter, 
uh, when the parameter is non-zero, our curve is smooth, and we the Riemann matrix exists, the Riemann theta functions exist, we can write them all down. As the parameter becomes zero, our curve develops nodal singularities. Um, and we can then go through, use the limits to actually find the degenerate version of the theta function um, and then the KP solutions. So in this situation, the theta function actually becomes a finite sum of exponentials with a very nice combinatorial description. And the function becomes a soliton solution. So we can actually express it in this Grassmannian interpretation. Um, and so here I'm explaining combinatorics that gets us there. Unfortunately, I don't think I have time for it. Um, so I guess uh, one interesting thing is that uh, our function, um, so we started off with a theta function that has an infinite, it's an infinite sum of exponentials ranging over the entire in, uh, integer lattice. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, when we do this degeneration, when we introduce singularities, we actually become a finite sum. And so the points that remain have a very nice combinatorial description. So um, here, I guess what's going on is when, as, as epsilon goes to zero, we really want to make sure that this term, um, so this, this term, uh, well, first of all, we need it to converge. So that means this term needs to not blow up, which means this condition has to hold. And this is, uh, we can rewrite it, linear algebra. This tells us that the Q norm of A has to be less than or equal to the Q norm of A minus C for any point C in the integer lattice. So this means this A is closer to the origin than to any, of, any other integer lattice point. It's not in Itself is not a limit. A is something. It's real. So, and this definition is exactly the definition of a Voronoi cell. The Voronoi cell is the set of all points that are closer to a specific point than to other points. So here, if we have a special norm, so in the Euclidean norm, this would look like a square. In a special norm, it might look like a hexagon. So. Uh, all of the points inside this hexagon are closer to zero than they are to anything else. And so for the function to converge, A has to be uh, in this hexagon. And moreover, the only terms that survive, so uh, most of these will go to zero, and the only terms that survive are the ones in the Delaunay set of A. And these are, once we have our point A, the Delaunay set is the set of all of the integer lattice points that are closest to it. So if we're inside the hexagon, then we really only have one point in there. It's not super interesting. But if we're on a boundary, then we might have more. And if we're on a, an edge between two, we'll have two. If we're on a vertex, that's the most interesting full dimensional case. We have a full dimensional polytope. Uh, that's our Delaunay polytope. And so the vertices of this are actually the ones where this, um, this function survives. <coughs> So now we can actually even consider the function with starting from a Delaunay set. We don't even really need to start with a curve. Um, so this is, I guess, a formalization of what I just explained. Um, well, I really need to be wrapping up. Okay. So uh, and just just for so we actually were able to. So this is the expression of the theta function for the Delaunay set, which is the square. This is the Euclidean norm, regular norm. Um, maybe I'll skip that. Okay, so then we define an analog to the de Broven threefold, which is called the Hirota variety. So now when we start with a nodal curve, family of nodal curves, so for example, um, something that looks like this, which has singularities, we can um, define our theta function. We now know what the degenerate theta function looks like. And now we can just ask for the same, the same question for which u, v, and w, and also a's, because now we have some a variables in there. For which u, v, w, and a, is it a solution to the KP equation? In this space, we called it the Hirota variety. 
Um, and then we studied it. So we gave uh, equations for it, um, which also have a combinatorial description. There's a nice combinatorial description of where these equations come from. Um, I don't have time for all this. Then in a later paper, uh, Claudia Fevel and I studied uh, just the case of the G cube. So this is a rational nodal curve with G nodes. So something that looks like this, if I just add more and more of them, just one, one component that intersects itself G times. There's some very nice combinatorics there. And the we, we really studied the hero to variety. And from um, the study, we were able to express it formally as a soliton solution. So here we have um, these lambdas. Uh, these, uh, so we have a matrix that uh, expresses it as a soliton. And actually, so if we take, if we restrict to positive lambdas, this is, and this is going to be a real regular solution to the KP equation. And we're actually covering a positroid cell. So a natural question, I guess, is so, so here we've associated a family of curves with a positroid cell. So a natural question or next step and something that we're working on now with um, also with Claudia, who we did this with and some other people um, we're working on uh, understanding this connection better. Is this just an accident or are there connections to other positroid cells? Are all positroid cells corresponding to families of curves or only some of them? Um, so this and many other questions remain. So uh, just some concluding remarks then. So uh, yeah, we can start with questions from physics and then we can study them as mathematicians. So these things uh, can be interesting to mathematicians even in their own right, like grass topes. Um, there are many open questions in um, grass topes and these Hirota varieties. Um, and the, the main thing I, I, I guess I'd like to say and advertise, so positivity, it's still kind of mysterious why it's so powerful. So um, with the, and, and why specifically it's so relevant to physics. And the subjects I've touched on in this talk are just a small part of the, the whole story. So there's a lot of people studying things related to positivity. In particular, recently and, and currently, there's a field emerging called positive geometry. There was recently a very large grant awarded to study this positive geometry, um, an ERC grant. Um, and it's, it's a very exciting field with still lots to uncover. And really, um, we're just here at the tip of the iceberg. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Elena. Questions from you. Which phrase at the end would be stay positive? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll put that in the next one. So, so the message is from the KP standard is that the standard soliton solutions are some limits of the Kritschewa mm -hmm. construction. Tropical limits. Yeah, have you thought about this in terms of the, 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 the Rasmanian of solutions that you mentioned that has group actions mm -hmm. on it? Can I see what kind of group would you think of? Uh, uh, with actions mapping, you know, producing certain specific uh, solutions to when and what kind of transformations. Uh, I think I know what kind of transformations can be solid one solutions. I don't really know about rich about solutions. Oh, I Are you asking about symmetries? One? Mm -hmm. Are you asking about symmetries? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. No, I, I, there is a big, uh, an international group action for us, some manian, on Sato's grass. Yes, yeah, so also. What is the analog of that in Kritschewa? Is there such a thing? Right, so that that's that's actually something we studied. So was it getting explicit, um, get, uh, explicitly from the Kritschewa construction starting from there and then getting 
uh, explicitly the points from the Sato Griswami. So there is a, there is a theory there in the practice that's hard to implement. There's no animal in the pool. I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Thank you very much.